committee before going to city council. I'm Anna Margos for LA This Week. And on a smaller but very tangible scale, Valley Councilman Mitch Englander is leading by example this Earth Day by refurbishing his lawn to battle the drought. Not only does his yard look better, he's saving money too. Gil Reyes reports. At his house in Granada Hills, Councilman Mitchell Englander took a bold step in water conservation that a growing number of homeowners are now considering. He ripped out his beloved front and backyard lawns and replaced them with drought-tolerant plants. The most difficult part of this job for me was convincing my wife. Now that we've done it, she couldn't be more thrilled and happy. Uh, and a happy wife is a happy life. In one day's work, the Englander's front yard went from this to this, looking better than before with sage, lavender, deer grass, and other desert plants that help conserve water on this fourth year of drought. And the kicker is the group Turf Terminators did all the work free of charge through the LADWP's rebate program. With the new gardens installed, the councilman is expected to save $75 per month on his monthly water bill. Add another $150 that he would have paid his gardener to maintain the lawn, and that amounts to $225 per month in savings. The LADWP reimburses you up to $3.75 per square foot if you replace the lawn yourself. Or you can call turf terminators like the Englanders did. You won't get a rebate. Turf Terminators receives it, but they also do all the work for you. Either way, the LADWP says more people are replacing their lawns through their program. We actually plan to be the end of the calendar year to have removed 25 million square feet of turf. Now to put that in perspective, the governor set a target of 50 million square feet for the entire state. That means half of the state's turf replacement goals are expected to be achieved just in the city of LA, beautifying homes while saving money and water. In Granada Hills, Gil Reyes for LA This Week. The governor is calling for a 25% reduction in urban water use statewide. And another Valley Councilman is doing his part for sustainability. Councilman Felipe Fuentes helped cut the ribbon at a new education center at the Lopez Canyon composting facility. And he's also gearing up to teach a class there himself. Anna Marcos has the details. The finer you make this material, the quicker that it'll compost. You're getting a sneak peek of what's on tap for the new Lopez Canyon Environmental and Education Center. This newly opened site will teach residents about sustainability with classes on making your own compost, on rain harvesting, drought tolerant planting, and something called compost tea. And then if you put it in a barrel with water, you create this compost tea and your tomatoes will love it. Turns out our very own honorable council member Felipe Fuentes has quite a green thumb and is an avid gardener. He will be teaching classes here. It's important for all of us to be more resilient and sustainable at home. The center sits on one of the largest composting facilities in L.A., Lopez Canyon in Lakeview Terrace, which in turn sits on an old landfill. It's hard to believe, but underneath these hills lie 16 million tons of landfill trash, hills which have now been transformed into a giant composting facility turning out 350 tons of earth-friendly compost every day. What had been waste now is reused, reprocessed, and as you said, back into the earth. So it's a perfect example of sustainability. And with the new environmental and education center, everyone can now learn to be a better caretaker of Mother Earth. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. For more information about classes at the Education Center, which start on May 9th, you can call 213-485-2260 or visit lacity.org slash SAN. Lots of folks are turning to apps to help them shorten their commute. In fact, one app in particular has grown in popularity. And now the city is getting on board to help users find even more ways to get around and avoid traffic delays. Yana Kay has more. This smartphone app, called Waze, helps drivers get to where they need to go. But it does more than just give directions. It reroutes motorists based on real-time input from other Wazers, helping cut down commute times. And now city leaders have joined with Waze in a new partnership. 
Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti made the announcement at the city's automated traffic surveillance and control center. The mayor said that as part of the agreement, ways in the city will share information such as planned road closures, construction work, or movie shoots. And because we'll use every single piece of information and push every button we can, we'll reduce traffic for Angelinos throughout the city. But this partnership doesn't just benefit commuters. City officials will be able to see problems being reported by motorists in real time, such as accidents, fallen trees, potholes, and other hazards, allowing the city to respond that much quicker to get the problem resolved. This doesn't just make ways better, this makes the city better. This makes us better at serving our constituents with one of the, the core issues that they talk about every single day in almost every single place they go is what is the best way to get from point A to point B as quickly as possible. Officials say the partnership will also provide new traffic data that city leaders will analyze to help improve traffic in the future. This is going to be updated in real time every two minutes uh, giving motorists the information they need uh, to avoid those road closures and to get home for dinner in time. Ways officials say there are 1.3 million motorists using the app in LA to share traffic information live. With that uh, comes for the first time the ability to look at that information at such a scale. We've never had this much information before about um, what's happening on the roads and when in real time. So hopefully we're going to be able to use that information to reduce congestion and improve public safety. City leaders hope this will lead to even more efficient interaction between the city and its citizens. I'm Yana Kay for LA This Week. As part of the partnership, Waze users will also be notified of hit and runs as well as Amber Alerts, so they'll be able to report any useful information to law enforcement. While you can now use the Waze app to help alert the city to traffic-related issues, most city problems should still be reported using the city's 311 number. And as Anna Marcos tells us, the mayor says 311's improved by leaps and bounds. Even the city's 311 call operators took a break from the phone to watch Mayor Eric Garcetti announce that 311 call response times have gotten better than ever for residents calling for help with city issues. In fact, there has been an 84% reduction in 311 call wait times. I'm proud to report that the average call wait time for 311 has dropped from 3 minutes and 48 seconds in 2012 to 53 seconds last year and this year. So now our residents will have to wait on average no more than a minute. At one time, close to a third of 311 callers would hang up before getting any help with city issues. Now the number of hang-ups is down to 9% as more callers get the help they need quickly. So what's made the difference? For one thing, operators are now better trained, so they provide better information to callers about various city departments. Also, the city has gone digital enlisting the help of the internet and phone apps like MyLA311. Our 311 call center, website, and mobile applications are all critical parts of this mission providing easy access to city services. We maneuvered our resources, uh, scheduling our people so that we're staffed more heavily during those peak periods so that we're here when the residents uh, need us. But even the serious business of manning the city phones has its lighter side. What's the craziest call you ever? Craziest call. He said he was uh, he wanted the missing person unit. I said why? He said he was the missing person. <laughs> <laughs> the city's 311 call center is open for business every day from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. But the phone app My LA 311 can handle calls anytime. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. A council member announces plans to run for a county seat, and the city of L.A. is getting into the concert business, sort of. These stories and more in City Beat. 12th District Councilman Mitch Englander has announced he intends to run for the L.A. County Supervisor seat, soon to be vacated by Michael Antonovich when he terms out next year. In a statement released by his campaign office, Englander says he brings a track record of proven leadership, as well as the unique experience of being a reserve police officer and city councilman. The 5th District County Supervisor seat covers much of the San Gabriel Valley and Foothill communities, parts of the San Fernando Valley and parts of the Antelope Valley. Englander was just re-elected in March to a second four-year term on the L.A. City Council. 
And as we just mentioned, Councilman Englander is an LAPD reserve officer. And this month, the LAPD is acknowledging some of the contributions made by the city's reserve officers as part of Reserve Officer Appreciation Month. In 2014, the 405 volunteers that make up the LA Police Reserve Corps saved the city of Los Angeles over $2 million by volunteering a combined 46,000 hours performing duties including working patrol and traffic units, assisting detectives with their investigations, as well as in administrative support functions. LA City Attorney Mike Fuhrer's office continues its crackdown on crime and gang-ridden properties, this time in South LA. Fuhrer's office has filed two nuisance abatement lawsuits, one at a single family residence on Wattsworth Avenue, the other at an apartment complex on 109th Place, the apartment building is a place where we allege multiple drug sales occur, where shootings occur, where guns have been recovered. In fact, Fuhrer says part of the lawsuit asks the court to require the absentee landlord of the apartment building to live there to experience what it's like for other residents in the area. The Los Angeles Board of Recreation and Parks Commissioners has voted in favor of the city taking over operations of the 5,800-seat Greek Theater. Back in October, the same commission had recommended turning over the Greek Theater's management from the venue's longtime operator, Meterlander, to Live Nation. But a city council committee had rejected that recommendation. Now, with the city set to take over the reins once Niederlander's contract ends in October, more of the profits from future concerts will stay within city coffers. The iconic Elks Lodge in San Pedro begins to rebuild after a devastating fire allegedly set by one of its former members. Gil Reyes reports from San Pedro. One year after fire destroyed San Pedro's historic Elks Lodge, its charred remains begin rising from the ashes. It was devastating loss, uh, the fact that uh, an arsonist took uh, our Elks Lodge away. But yet today, again, uh, there's so much, uh, there's a sense of community pride um, and a commitment, a renewed commitment of building the most pristine lodge uh, in the country. Elks Lodge member and area councilman Joe Buscaino helped break ground on a new clubhouse. It will include some surviving parts of the old structure, like the signature pagoda roof. Cost of the new lodge, several million dollars. Much of that is expected to be covered by insurance. This is going to continue the, the history that we have in the community, helping those less fortunate. This lodge was used primarily for our Elks activities to raise money for veterans, disabled children, and our scholarship funds. Uh, the Elks are the second largest next to the U.S. government in giving scholarships. So we gave scholarships every year uh, to area high school students throughout San Pedro, the Palisbury Peninsula. Fellow Elks were shocked when authorities charged former lodge member Nick Pekarich with arson. He's pleaded not guilty. He's also found to be mentally incompetent to stand trial and remains hospitalized for observation. The original lodge, built in the 1960s, offered scenic views of San Pedro Harbor before fire destroyed it last April. These seascapes will be part of the new facility when it opens, expected completion date within two years. And we're so excited to move forward and put this fire behind us um, with the sense of hope that we will rebuild and we will rise from the ashes. In San Pedro, Gil Reyes for L.A. This Week. Investigators say surveillance video helped link Pekarich to the crime. In this week's list of things to do, a dance company celebrates its 10th anniversary. Rock and roll billboards go down in history and champagne and croquet on a Sunday. If you love dance, then we've got just the ticket. The Los Angeles Contemporary Dance Company takes a look back at a decade of dance with a retrospective performance and 10-year celebration. A group of 18 dancers will showcase six works from the company's repertoire, spanning from their choreographic history from 2005 to 2015. You'll have two chances to catch the performance on Friday, May 1st, starting at 8.30 p.m., and on Saturday, May 2nd, starting at 6.30 p.m. The shows will be held at the LA Theater Center, located at 514 South Spring Street. For more information and prices, go to lacontemporarydance.org.
And who would have thought billboards would be part of musical history? Well, they are, and they're being celebrated at the Skirball Cultural Center, featuring more than 20 photographs of hand-painted billboards that dominated the Los Angeles landscape for almost two decades. A rock and roll billboards exhibition brings to life a unique period in the history of rock and roll. Photographer Robert Landau traces the billboard phenomenon from the promotion of The Doors' debut album in 1967 to the advent of MTV in the 1980s. 80s. The current exhibit runs through August 16. The Skirball is located at 2701 North Sepulveda Boulevard. For more information, visit skirball.org slash exhibitions. And on Sunday, May 3rd, swing into action at Barnsdall Art Park's Spring Champagne and Croquet Fundraiser. Promising to be an afternoon of fun and games, you can get competitive or just relax on the lush west lawn of Frank Lloyd Wright's famed Hollyhock House, which recently reopened to the public following an extensive restoration. All Angelinos are invited, including kids. No experience or formal dress is required. The festivities begin at 11 a.m. Barnsdall Art Park is located at 4800 Hollywood Boulevard. For more information, go to barnsdall.org slash events. And that's a look at some upcoming things to do. And we end this week's show with a sneak peek at a story we're working on for next week. It's also our This Week in Tweets. It's the story of a boy named Noah who flew here from Vermont courtesy of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. His wish to be an L.A. police officer for a day. And boy, did he get his wish with many other departments joining in. At L.A. Airport PD, that's the official Twitter handle for the L.A. Airport Police, tweeted, Thank you, Noah, for allowing us to be part of your day today. The Airport Police joined with LAFD and LAPD in welcoming Noah as he and his family disembarked from his flight. And no time was wasted. L.A. Airport PD tweeted these photos of Noah watching the Airport Police canine demonstration on the airfield and meeting the handlers. Again, we'll bring you that story next week. And that's going to do it for this edition. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ellen Chang. A reminder that you can catch us online at lacityview.org. You can also follow and like us on Facebook. We'll see you back here next week for more of L.A. This Week. We're taking steps to improve our airfield. Congress requires all U.S. airports to add new runway safety areas. As the second busiest airport in the country, planning for construction and maintenance of our four runways is a unique challenge. LAX staff has worked with the FAA and airlines for the past year to create a plan meeting the new regulations with the least impact to our passengers. The safety zones at the end of each runway will be improved so that a plane can safely stop in the event it overruns or undershoots a runway. The work will make our already safe runways even safer. And while we're working, we're going to take advantage of closed runways and do some maintenance, saving time. Runway construction begins March 2015 and will continue through 2018. The phased closures could cause delays similar to what we have on bad weather days. Communities around LAX may also experience increased air traffic noise while the work is being completed. We will continue to work closely with the airlines as we improve our runways, keeping the passenger experience our top priority. Progress is happening. For more information, visit LAXisHappening.com. Don't worry, Patty. This isn't going to hurt me one bit. Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Shapiro in beautiful Encino, and you're watching L.A. City View, Channel 35. Our city, our channel. Open wide.
to Council Chambers. I want to thank Mr. Uh, Farrell for being if you're in your offices Members, please report to the council chambers. Members, please report to the council chambers.
members, if you're in your offices, would you report to the council chambers?
Good morning. It's Friday, May 1st. want to welcome you to your Los Angeles City Council. This council meets every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 a.m. Madam Clerk, we do have a uh, quorum. Could you please call the roll? Blumenfeld, Bonnet, Buscaino, Cedillo, Englander, Fuentes, Wizard, Crest, Recording, LaBange, Martinez, O'Farrell, Parks, Price, Wesson, 10 members present, a quorum, Mr. President. Thank you very much. First order of business. Approval of the minutes. Englander moves, Bloomingfield seconds. Next. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Martinez moves, Price seconds. Next. Mr. President, would you like to run through the agenda? Yes, I would. Items one and two are items for which public hearings have been held. Members on one and two, any specials? Then let's prepare to vote on these items. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 10 ayes. Okay, that brings us where? Items three and four, items for which public hearings have not been held. 10 votes required for consideration. Okay, so uh, without objection, those items are now before this body. There are cards on both items. Okay, then we'll hold those items. I want to take a moment to recognize the open magnet charter school. They're from the west side in the back. Can you give them a round of applause? Is there any way, I know they're all the way in the back, but can we get them on television? Do we have a camera angle and pan the crowd? Look at, look at yourselves, guys. Can we pan the crowd a little bit? I want your parents to be able to, to see you. Nice smiles. You might be discovered. I had an a opp opportunity to... Uh, take a photograph with them earlier, the mayor and myself. So uh, welcome uh, to City Hall. We hope to see you again. So again, Open Magnet Charter School, welcome to City Hall. Okay. I'm going to do a couple of general public comment cards. I'm going to do uh, Brian Barajas and uh, Yvonne Mitchell-Altry. Please come up. Yes, Mr. Bra. Uh, all right. All right. In recent days, I think people have heard uh, there is a secret uh, meeting that can utterly give these uh, assholes our country. And what I refer to is uh, Obama's push for TPP, the Trans Pacific Partnership. There are Democrats who have woken to the reality that. Uh, this country is going to the gutter, even worse than whatever that is. So the battle lines have been drawn. The only people who are pushing for reality is LaRouche Pack. And I think that the intention for your city, giving that uh, Labor Day protesters are on the rise, I think the only way out is to give the, the people their country back. Thank you. Before I call Ms. Autry, I'm going to switch back to uh, uh, one of our um, items on the agenda. So it'll be item three. Is Mr. Spindler here? Mr. Uh, Herman? Mr. Walsh? Mr. Herman, a.k.a. Mike Fuhr. Come on, Mr. Herman. Just, no, just stick to the item. Are we in item three now, sir? Yes, we are. Just regarding the rent escrow, as I call it, reap or rip off people who want to rent and live in Los Angeles. You continue this process, which is great. It's one thing I can applaud you for, that you're making it habitable to live in the city of Los Angeles 
We don't have to live with the varmints of carrots, animals Stay loose on in the, the street. Subject. Well, he's in the animal service. Stay but on the on subject. Regarding that, when I hold my time to this one minute, I say continue it and keep all of us in Los Angeles free of varmints, habitable living, cost of good living when we rent, and keep the standards of the machine called landlords, slumlords, in their correct modem, which is provided safe, healthy, clean homes to live in, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Mr. Walsh. John Walsh blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org or Jay Walsh Confidential tweeting at Hollywood Dems. Uh, this is, of course, an excellent program. And remember, when you do a good job, I tell you, I'm not one of those white guys, oh, you're all a bunch of crooks. When you do a good job, and you do a good job on what this is, REAP. Now, the, the REAP here is for three uh, uh, addresses, South Eldon, South Budlong, and West 66th. The people who live at those addresses went to the landlord and said, there are code violations here. The landlord didn't give a damn and did nothing. They went to the city. The city sent a letter to the, uh, the landlord and said, repair the code violations in these apartments. The landlord told the city to do, to go stuff it. So what does the city do now? The city sent them a registered letter and said, from now on, they sent it to the tenant. You don't pay the rent to the landlord. You pay the rent to us until the landlord repairs all the damage and all the code violations. That's why I'm saying to everybody out there, if there are code violations in your apartment and you have to know what they are, uh, you must tell the landlord in writing. If the landlord doesn't do it, you go to the city, and then the city cracks down. Now, if you go to other cities like Glendale, they're all Republican. The landlord can get away with anything he wants. But here in this city, because of this city council and because of Jackie Goldberg, notice how they don't stop me when I go off the subject if I'm praising them, HollywoodHighlands.org. Okay, thank you. No, I didn't call you, Miss Autry. I don't have a card on this item. No, I West, don't. One second. I Once I don't have a card, so just one second. Sergeants, could we check? I called you for public comment. I'm going to switch right back and, and call you right back up. I did. I turned in that card. I did I, turn it in. Anyway, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. I did turn it in. Um, what I'd like to find say, her card. Go ahead. I, I did turn it in. Thank you. Thank you, Herman. Uh, what I'd like to say is that as a recipient and a member of the affordable housing program, I'm so grateful for that opportunity as we were the indigenous people. Now as regentrification is underway, you know, you've totally disregarded the fact that we are here. There are veterans, there are abandoned women, there are single women, there are, are men of various, uh, you know, races that are still receiving uh, this and, and join. Stay on the item, Ms. Well, we appreciate Audrey. the fact that we have affordable uh, uh, rent and access to that, and you need to proliferate that. You need to increase that. Remember, this is democracy for all of the people, not just those who are, um, you know, giving kickbacks to your, your campaigns, but all of the people, not just the major real estate developers, poor people, middle class you, of all races. You're not on the item. Okay. So I thank you very much. I've warned you a couple of times. Okay, let's prepare to... Uh, Vote on this item. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. No eleven applause. Eyes. Thank you. That was eleven eyes. It passes. No applause, Mr. Herman. Now let's go to item four. I have Mr. Spindler, Mr. Walsh, Mr. Herman. I will not be accepting any more cards on that item because we've already started. So come on, Mr. Uh, Walsh. Asked enough. John Walsh, blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org, or Jay Walsh Confidential, tweeting at Hollywood Dems. This is very interesting. They're disguised this. You've got to go to the agenda package and see what they're doing here. Feasibility of temporarily, temporarily closing Golden Avenue cul-de-sac. That's a fancy word for blind alley. Um, located at the James Ed Wood Boulevard, that's in uh, Mid-City, uh, west of the 110 Freeway, Westlake. Okay, what are they doing here? You gotta see at the bottom, 
Public Works and Gang Reduction Committee waive consideration of the matter. What they are doing is that the gangs are so in control of the city because they pay, they pay off the cops to sell drugs. As I said, 3,000 years ago, they were selling drugs in Alexander, Egypt. Stay on uh, the item. They'd be paying off the cops. They're paying off the cops at, at this address. So actually, the city is doing a good job because the LAPD is, is you know, uh, looking the other way. It's so out of control in this neighborhood. This, is, incidentally, is a neighborhood of minorities where they're allowed to Now, sell you're not drugs. on the subject, Mr. Walsh, the, your last warning. Now, this located, so what they are doing here, see, he does, he's part of it. That's why he's... Uh, he's no, uh, your time has expired. Thank you. So if I could have the next speaker, which would be Mr. Herman. Mr. Herman, please stay on the subject. Yes. Our, our Angelinos have brought some fine students to our chambers. As soon as we finish with uh, Mr. Herman, we'll introduce him. Please come forward, Mr. Herman. I'm going to start your time. I'm sorry. I was just acknowledging the fine students. No, but stay back. on the item. Sorry, sir. Sorry. You're the boss. This is regarding a consideration by Cedillo. Excuse me, sir, as I'm speaking. But this is regarding. May I hold my time, sir? Would you regarding stay on Mr. the subject? Regarding Mr. and Bonin relative to the feasibility of a temporary closing of a gang related area off of the Golden Avenue cul-de-sac located at James M. Wood Boulevard west of the 110 freeway. Now these problems with gangs continues when we have to close freeways and streets and cul-de-sacs, but the whole issue here is the recommendation by council's action, which is to instruct the city engineer to report with recommendations to create some feasible, feasibility, temporality, closing the Golden Avenue cul-de-sac. Now, I find that discriminatory because there are people in the neighborhood who have to walk all around the cul-de-sac just to get to the location or area that we all should have access to, children. But again, I can't find any reason why Mr. Bonin wants to close the cul-de-sac. I mean, is there an issue with the gangs there, Mr. Um, Bonin? No answer. Never mind. No that. answer. No Stay answer. on the item. Again, at James M. Wood Boulevard, west of the 110 freeway, in the West Lake, on the white side of the area, for public safety reasons, there it goes, public safety reasons. So you're going to close the cul-de-sac because, again, the issue of what John Walsh was saying, the Warren gangs is out of control. They control Stay on the, the cul-de-sac. And to solicit and input gang graffiti from the adjacent property owners. The community impact report, none submitted because not one of you took an action like Jose Weizar to clean up our streets and give us good living for access. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Labange, quickly. Thank you, uh, members of the city council and our guests. Please welcome the Chandler School from Pasadena, California. Give them a big hand. Stand, stand up. up. Students, stand up there. Good job. Pasadena, the crown See of the valley. Yourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Labange, and welcome to the Los Angeles City Council. Okay, Mr. Spindler. Again, thank you for the young people seeing this Supreme Court decision pending for the James Wood closure of the cul-de-sac. Why do we have cul-de-sacs on James M. Wood? Because it's a commercial district and there's warehouses and places where commercial trucks have to turn around, go back out, and then they go back on 8th Street that goes past the new 110 ramps on and off the freeway past Staples Center to Figueroa. So the reason we have cul-de-sacs is so they don't have to make U-turns in major intersections. These streets are very, very narrow. But also, we've had homeless encampments. And for the young people to understand, homeless encampments are on those cul-de-sacs. That's because when you grow up and you lose your home, you have to live on a tent. Stay on the subject. By the river. The subject. 
at a cul-de-sac. That's where you wind up. When you get old like me... No, you're off the subject. You Thank to, you, Mr. Spindler. Let's prepare to vote on this item. Let's open the roll, <coughs> close the roll, tabulate the vote. Twelve eyes. You're now uh, disrupting this meeting. Okay, Mr. Uh, Englander, and I believe Mr. Uh, Mr. Weezar is ready. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I'm quite honored today, as uh, the city of Los Angeles is, to uh, have with us uh, the mayor of the city of Puebla in Mexico. And he is visiting us this weekend for Cinco de Mayo festivities taking place throughout the city and was selected recently as a distinguished poblano by the Poblano community here in the city of Los Angeles. And we are talking about uh, not only a great mayor, but a great friend of mine and to the city of Los Angeles, Jose Antonio Gali Fayad. Bienvenido a la ciudad de Los Angeles. More commonly referred to as Tony Gali, he was elected as mayor of Puebla in 2014. And prior to being elected as mayor, Gali served as the head secretary, the Secretariat of Infrastructure of the State of Government during Governor Rafael Moreno Valle's term. During that time, he contributed to the transformation of the state of Puebla with the goal of improving the quality of life for the people of Puebla with more than 500 public projects. Tony's goal is to make Puebla the heart of Mexico, focusing on infrastructure improvements, but also on Puebla's unique history, culture, and of course, food. I was very fortunate to visit Puebla two years ago, and colleagues, let me tell you, it is definitely a place that you will want to visit in your lifetime. You really see the historical and cultural connection between Latin America and the world that is reflected in Puebla's history and cultural and food experiences. I was fortunate to meet Mayor Tony Gali at that time, and I consider him a friend and a great ambassador for Puebla and all of Mexico. Last year, Tony was here for the annual Feria de los Moles, and at that time, I learned that in addition to him being a great public servant, he is also a great singer. <laughs> <laughs> Impromptuly, he got up and sang a few songs to the hundreds, if not thousands, of people who gathered at that event, and people were shouting, otra, otra, <laughs> otra, which in Spanish means another, another, another. I highly respect the work that Tony is doing in his hometown of Puebla as a public servant who really cares about the people and the job he was entrusted to serve. In many respects, it is similar to what we do here in our council districts, including making sure that there is responsible growth and development, but at the same time, we ensure that we preserve the history and culture of our communities. And today we have a few special guests who are here to join Tony Gali. Uh, we have Ricardo Herrera, who is the director of Mi Casa Es Puebla. Bienvenido, señor, gracias, bienvenido. And unfortunately, we love the fact that the government of Puebla uh, created this house, but it's right across the street from the city of Los Angeles in the county. But we're there to support the house in any way we can. Uh, we also have with us uh, uh, no stranger to these chambers, uh, someone who works very hard to ensure that the great relationship we have with the country of Mexico continues. And given the bi-nationality, bi-cultural experiences that many of us are experiencing now, uh, our Council General is doing a tremendous job uh, making sure that we not only do good for today, but plan for the future as well. So I'd like to welcome to the microphone Mexican General Counsel Carlos Sada. Bienvenido, señor. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Councilman uh, Wizard. We are delighted to be here today because it's uh, one of the most representative, if not the most representative date uh, in the Mexican calendar. And, uh, and uh, it is uh, celebrated in Puebla in particular. And we are so honored and pleased to have the very mayor of the city of Puebla where the, where the battle was fought. And this invitation of uh, Mr. Wizard, I think, uh, 
uh, you should take into consideration because it is worth going to visit the fortress where the, 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 the battle took place. So you realize what was the episode and how a Mexican army of only 2,000, 3,000 people defeated the army of Napoleon III, who was 7,000 to 8,000 well-armed people, but we were fighting, we were fighting for our liberty, for our freedom. And that is what set the basis of what Mexico is about nowadays. And why it has a repercussion in California and in all the United States? It is because we stopped the army of the French, of Napoleon III, who wanted to conquer the United States while you were in a civil war. And uh, they were joining for, well, they, they wanted to join for forces with the Confeder Confederates. If that had happened, they were in favor of the uh, uh, slave states. That's why in California, in California they realized because California was not one of these states that were supporting slavery. And Mexico, Mexico in our constitution, and once we gain our independence in 1821, uh, uh, one of the most important clauses was no slavery, freedom for everybody. So California was contaminated with that spirit of freedom of Mexico. And what, why it, it started to be celebrated more and more in California and more and more in the whole of the United States once the Civil War was over. So there is a strong and very deep connection between Mexico and California, between Mexico and the United States because of that. And Mayor Gali is representing so well what it's all about. We're going to have a lot of celebration in these two, three days. He's going to be here. Of course, he has to go back to Cinco de Mayo in Puebla because the most important parade, military parade of Mexico takes place precisely in the city of Puebla. So again, we invite you to, to go to Puebla and we thank you so much to all the members of, uh, of uh, the, the Council of LA for your continued support to our causes, to our community, and for strengthening the relationship between Mexico and the United States, between Mexico and California, and between Mexico and Puebla in particular, with Mexico and Los Angeles. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. And I'd also love to uh, thank our friends from UPEX and the Poblanos who are here with us today. Uh, they not only are great supporters of many civic events in the city of Los Angeles, but given the growing number of poblanos in the city of Los Angeles, we remind our Mexican counterparts that poblanos do not only exist in New York, as has been the historical uh, um, uh, uh, place where many poblanos went to, and uh, they have been responsible for creating the Feria de los Moles, one of the largest culinary experiences uh, in the United States now, as thousands upon thousands of people visit our historic birthplace here at Placito Alvera and uh, partake in the competition between uh, what mole is better between Puebla and uh, the Oaxaqueños. Um, <laughs> Mayor Gali would say it's Puebla. Our Council General would say Oaxaca since he's from Oaxaca, but uh, we'll see uh, when the Feria de los Moles comes again. All right, we also have with us uh, a surprise guest, uh, Dr. David Hayes Bautista. Uh, who wrote a book about Cinco de Mayo and explained some of the historical context in which why Cinco de Mayo became so popular here in the United States. As many of you know, uh, oftentimes it is confused with the independence of Mexico, which is actually on the 16th of September. But its historical significance, as our Council General just mentioned, actually had uh, repercussions here in the United States that if that hadn't happened in Mexico, the Confederate states would have had additional support, and who knows what would happen in those battles that happened. But uh, Dr. Hayes Bautista has now written a book that contextualizes that and has strained a lot of history out, and he's here with us today to share a few words. Dr. Hayes Bautista. Thank you. Thank you. Well, to begin with, poblanos from Puebla. There was a poblano member of the city council in 1791 came from Puebla, and he was member. he sat in your predecessor's chairs. His, he, he was alive when Mexico declared independence, abolished slavery, and decreed racial equality. His grandson fought in the American Civil War as member of the Caballeria de Nativos de California, Spanish-speaking U.S. cavalry, to support freedom, to abolish slavery, and to support racial equality. That is why we began celebrating Cinco de Mayo, because it's part of this longer Mexican tradition here in Los Angeles, and we will continue to support these things, efforts in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. And with that, now uh, I'd love to introduce to you a great individual, a great human who's doing a lot for the city of Puebla, uh, and uh, someone who we consider a friend here in the city of Los Angeles, Mayor Tony Gali. Bienvenido, señor. 
Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias, Officer Wizard. Eh, muchas gracias a todos los consejeros. Me siento muy honrado de estar con todos ustedes. Muy honrado por esta invitación. Muy honrado por acompañarlos, por estar con todos ustedes. Muy agradecido también con el cónsul. Muchas gracias a Carlos Sada, que nos recibe Carlos Manuel cada año. Pero sobre todo por esa hermandad que tenemos Puebla y la ciudad de Los Ángeles. Puebla también es la ciudad de Los Ángeles. Fue fundada por Los Ángeles. Puebla es también la ciudad de Los Ángeles. Fue fundada por Los Ángeles en su historia. En 1531 se trazó por Los Ángeles la ciudad y por eso tenemos muchas cosas en común. En 1531 la ciudad gain its 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 history and that's why we have a lot of things in common. Cumplimos 484 años el pasado 16 de abril. The uh, past April 16th uh, we've celebrated our 484th birthday. Y quiero hacer la invitación a todos ustedes para el 16 de abril del año 2016 para que nos acompañen a los 485 años de la Fundación de Puebla. And I would like to invite all of you on April 16, 2016 to come to Puebla and celebrate our 485 year. Agradezco mucho la proclama que le van a entregar hoy a un servidor y I'm al municipio de Puebla. Very grateful and I appreciative of the proclamation that you're going to provide uh, me and also the, the Puebla. Seguiremos trabajando muy de cerca por los migrantes. We will continue working closely in favor of the immigrants. Y por lo que venimos el día de hoy, por nuestro 5 de mayo de 1862, ya lo comentó nuestro querido cónsul. And the reason why we're here is for the celebration of 5 de mayo of 1862, as the previous uh, author mentioned. Ya lo comentó también nuestro concejal Wizard y el doctor Hakes. Es motivo de orgullo estar con todos ustedes el día de hoy. Muchísimas gracias. Que Dios los bendiga. Thank you. And, uh, we, we do have one, uh, one member on the queue. Oh, sure. Uh, Mr. Labonge. I just wanted to say. Mr. Weezar, let's give Mr. Weezar a big hand you, for always doing these things. Our heritage, our history is so important. Mr. Mayor, be careful uh, with that smile. They may discover you in Hollywood, so you may not get back to Pueblo. And I rise to salute the Council General. What's so important is Los Angeles members, as you know, next to Hong Kong, next to New York, has the most consulates. And the Mexican consulate on 6th Street which used to be in the 4th District, Mr. Cedillo, was always now in the 1st District, was always a great part of our activity and the work to help encourage people. So I say welcome, congratulations, and uh, Mr. Weezer again, another uh, home run of bringing us together to learn history and to celebrate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. President. So thank you so much, and at this time, I would love to present uh, to the mayor of Puebla, Tony Gali, a resolution uh, on behalf of the city of Los Angeles and our mayor, uh, welcoming you to the city of LA once again, but also to thank you for the bridges you have created, to thank you for the tremendous work you are doing in Puebla. You are an example of what it means to be a great public servant, and also to uh, thank you for the support you've been giving to migrants of Puebla descent here, poblanos here in the city of Los Angeles. Felicidades, muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias. And uh, I'd also like to welcome the First Lady of the City of Puebla, who's here with us today, Tony Gali's wife. Bien, bienvenida. Gracias por estar aquí con nosotros. And I'd like to turn it over to uh, Council Member Paul Kokorian for a special announcement. Well, 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And uh, I'm. If, if we could. Anyway, just please, yeah, just wait one second. Or. Yes. As they're making their way out of chambers, um, if you can uh, just keep it down for and make your way out, we'd really, truly appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Yes, please. Thank All right. You. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. President. Sorry for that brief delay, but um, I just uh, wanted to take a moment to recognize two young women who have made uh, a tremendous contribution to the work of my office uh, and uh, also have assisted me in my work here and, and thereby have done a considerable contribution to the city, to people of the city of Los Angeles as well. Uh, we, I've had... Um, them working on policy issues, communications issues, uh, and just about everything else that, that we do uh, in in my office. Uh, my two interns who are concluding their three-month stint in my office today, uh, Ida Chakyan and Ripsime Bizazian, and I just want to tell you a little bit about them. Uh, Arda, did I say Ida? I'm sorry, Arda. Arda is a junior at USC, uh, majoring in economics. Right on. Um, she's been a vice president of Alpha Gamma Sigma Honor Society, as well as uh, she's uh, participating in Omicron Delta Epsilon, which is an international honor society in economics. And just recently in March, she was invited to um, participate in a Sorel, uh, the Sorel uh, program in Sacramento, a Sorel seminar in political leadership in Sacramento under the USC uh, Unruh Institute. And I know that she's going to go on to do uh, big things in public service, uh, given that background uh, and her service here. Ripsime, similarly, uh, has done a great deal already in her young and early career. She's a junior at Occidental College, majoring in, in diplomacy and world affairs. Uh, so a diplomacy and world affairs major from Occidental. I mean, there's somebody else who went to Occidental who is pretty important in world affairs. And, you know, I don't know, maybe she's on the same path. Um, she is fluent in Armenian and Spanish and just finished her first year of Russian studies. Uh, her plans for this summer including going to Cuba uh, with a grant that she won uh, to study dissident bloggers and their influence in the international community. Um, she's already uh, done considerable international volunteerism in Armenia and uh, to, to help inspire young people to get involved and uh, in volunteerism and so on. So these are both remarkable young women who are on their way to doing many more remarkable things. And I, I couldn't be more honored to have had them serve in my office. And so uh, I want to thank them. Arda, thank you very much. And Ripsi, I thank you very much for your service to our district and to our city. Did they want to say a few words? Mr. Kokorian, <laughs> did, did they want to say a few words? I think they're they're no. they're declining, but thank okay. you for the offer. Yes. Uh, they speak through their work, Mr. President. Of course, and their yes. work has been extraordinary. Very well said. Let's give them a round of applause. Fantastic. And are are they going to stay through the rest of the budget for you as well? Or are they today's their last day? Are they? Last day doesn't mean they can quit early. They can't quit early. That's it. All right, you got it. Thank you so much. And uh, with that, I believe that concludes our presentations and special presentations. Madam Clerk, where does that take us? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, we've got a, uh, excuse me, a special introduction from Council Member Cedillo. Members, it's a, a day of many distinguished Mexicans who join us, and today we have Professor Martin Veloz Huerta and his wife, Ana Rosa Sandoval, and he is the municipal president, or Ben, M municipal president, or referred to as the, the mayor of Aposol, Zacatecas, which is the home state, as we know, of Mr. Wizar. And he's in town this weekend to celebrate 30 years of service with their, their uh, club, Social Amigos de Oposol Zacatecas, which has been providing uh, services 
to uh, elderly residents in this uh, municipality. So with that, Señor, ¿cómo okay. está? Qué gusto, bienvenido. Gracias, muy vale. Hola. Hola, ¿cómo está? Let's give them a round of applause. All right, thank you. And uh, with that, we have a special presentation from Council Member Paul Coretz. Well, colleagues, it's my great pleasure to salute a tremendously dedicated journalist who's also part of our city family. Uh, since 2006, Ellen Chang has served as producer, anchor, assignment editor, and news director for LA This Week, LA City View 35's Emmy Award-winning weekly news magazine. A uh, graduate of UC San Diego, she received her master's degree in journalism from Northwestern University's Maydill School of Journalism. She then uh, reported live in the field and anchored and produced for faraway news organizations like uh, the ABC affiliate in Arkansas and the NBC affiliate in Massachusetts before returning home to the Southland to work for Mandarin language cable station Skylink based in Rosemead. As a reporter, she's covered a wide variety of breaking news stories ranging from crime to disaster and has written features on politics and human interest and produced specials on science and technology. She began freelancing for Channel 35 in 2004, reporting for LA This Week and hosting a number of their talk shows and major televised city-related events, just as, such as the Mayor's Inaugural Ceremony and the LADWP's Holiday Light Festival. Uh, since she obviously possessed the requisite skills and talents, Ellen quickly ascended to producer and anchor for LA This Week, becoming a familiar face to many Angelinos who regularly watch LA City View 35. For delivering the highest quality of broadcast journalism, Ellen Chang has been awarded the best news series for LA This Week by the National Association of Telecommunication Officers and Advisors. <laughs> from the Associated Press, she has received awards from be for best breaking news and best newscast. And along the way, she's found the time to raise a family, obviously. Uh, she and her husband, Mitch, are the proud parents of two young girls, Penelope, aged four, and Louisa, aged two. Um, and they are here to, with us today, along with her sister, Sandra. Uh, Ellen, also, Ellen also loves sharing with others her joy of traveling, dancing, and sushi. And now, after 11 distinguished years as reporter, anchor, and producer of over 450 shows, and 5,800 plus episodes of LA This Week, Ellen will live, leave her contract post at Channel 35 to officially join the city family as she becomes a full-time staffer at the DWP's Public Relations Division. So, Ellen, we just wanted to tell you how much we in City Hall and out in the communities of Los Angeles have appreciated your stellar work with Channel 35 and your great team, which has always done a phenomenal job of communicating the issues of the day to the public. Um, and I know this was at least a little bit of a surprise for you, so, uh, uh, but if you have anything on the spur of the moment to say, I'd like to give you a chance to say a few words. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is such an honor. I have worked at the station for over a decade and have covered all of you guys and covered all the presentations and proclamations and, you know, amazed at the wonderful things all the honorees have done. And all I ever had to do was produce a TV show. So I'm very just humbled. And I learned so much in this job covering all of your districts and all the things that your offices have done. And it's just been a lot of fun and a great journey. So, and I'm glad to be remaining within the city family in a different respect. So thank you all so much for this honor. And now on the behalf of the council, mayor, city attorney, city controller, and uh, a grateful city, I'd like to present you with this plaque of recognition for all your good work. 
Thank you so much. And I want to, oh. I see. I want to thank all of my bosses at ITA, Mark Wolf, Ted Ross, and Ted Lynn for supporting me and surprising me with this. I was shocked. So thank you. And my colleagues, Cameron and Yana, for being here. Yana's going to be the new anchor, report, uh, anchor for the show. So, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. And uh, okay, Madam Clerk, where does that take us? Mr. President, that brings counsel to general public comment. Great, general public comment. If we can start off. <laughs> we don't applaud for, for just announcements and uh, running through agenda items. Uh, and that, that is a disruption of this meeting. So you will not disrupt this meeting. Once again, uh, we will now go to general public comment. Uh, first two cards I'll bring up together. Lafonza Butler and Rusty Hicks, if you both want to come on up. Morning. Good morning. Members of the council, council president, uh, my name is LaFonza Butler. I'm co-chair of the Raise the Wage campaign. We are here as 220 community organizations, nonprofits, small businesses, large businesses, uh, gathered to, to ask the council to hear the voices of over 100,000 Angelinos represented in these petitions to raise the wage in Los Angeles, to enforce the wage in Los Angeles, and to ensure that workers have the right to sit, earn sick pay in this city. We are standing with a number of our uh, co-chairs as a part of the coalition. You have workers in front of you from every industry across Los Angeles. We are asking that you hear the voices, see us standing on the shoulders of 700,000 Angelinos who are waiting for you to act to raise the wage and enforce it with sick days 
uh, in the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the council, my name is Rusty Hicks and I'm a proud co-convener with my colleague LaFonza of the Raise the Wage uh, campaign. Uh, your, your city is calling you. 100,000 residents in the city of LA have signed a supporter card asking for $15 an hour with no loopholes, strong wage enforcement, and earned sick days. Now, if you think about how much 100,000 actually is, Let's put it in terms of a minimum wage earner in the city of LA. They would have to work for five and a half years to come close to $100,000. This 100,000, these 100,000 cards are really just a sampling of the support that you see, that we see in the city for this comprehensive policy. There are three quarters of a million people that are living below $15 an hour. There are 22, 23% of the city that is working and living in poverty. And this council has the opportunity to do something about it. So we ask that you answer that call, step forward and pass a comprehensive policy, $15 an hour as soon as possible, strong wage enforcement and earn sick days in the city of LA. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, did you have any other speakers that perhaps will be turning in cards that wish to speak? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. We'll go ahead and uh, you're going to leave these here for us as well? These, these aren't all speaker cards to come up and speak right now. Not yet. But they're coming. Okay. All right. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. You got to be careful. Okay, Mike Bonin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say it's nice to see that so many people agree with Mr. Price and Ms. Martinez and I. <laughs> Very well, yes. Excellent. All right, before we take the next cards, we'll wait for uh, council chambers to, to clear out a little bit. All right, let's go ahead and take uh, the next public comment cards. Yvonne Autry. Is Yvonne? Come on up. Followed by Wayne Spindler. Wayne, you're after Yvonne. Thank you for an opportunity, another opportunity to address you regarding this issue. Uh, uh, Mr. P Councilman Parks is already aware of the formation or the effort to form and to actually authorize the, uh, the Skid Row Neighborhood Council. So as a predecessor, I'm encouraging you, urging you to please support this item, this measure, this opportunity, when you will have the, the opportunity to use your authority to, to enable us to have a greater voice in self-government 
of the Skid Row uh, area so that we can make sure that we have accessible, affordable housing so that we can remove the homeless from the street out of the swath of police violence, especially racial or economically motivated elimination, extermination, holocaust of these people that you have put and engineered to be homeless, mostly black people. So again, I'm encouraging you to vote in favor of the formation of uh, the Skid Row Neighborhood Council. Of course, this is under uh, General Jeff. You'll have an opportunity probably in the very near future. Thank you. Thank you. Wayne, come on up, followed by Mr. Herman. Thank you. The fifth and final day of the city of LA's first ever Turkish Pride Day. Let us all remember Turkey, Armenia, live in peace live in peace and they can and they will without agitators now today they're asking for fifteen dollars an hour i think you guys should step up and make it twenty dollars an hour as a minimum wage in the city of los angeles and make it effective january first twenty sixteen that way you get it out of the way we can have that as a sustainable, not a living wage, a sustainable wage. That's what it should be. Why stop at 15? Go to the 20. Thank you. Morning, gentlemen. The ACLU, the California judges have ruled for $20 million to be spent on body cameras today. As you see, one of the commissioners, Sandra, was sitting in on the presentations. It's too bad she couldn't be here. But as, as many of you have heard and seen the demonstration, one cowbow, one clap, and one outspoken silent clap, and the little peon dwarf gets upset with us. Why is that unconstitutional? And so unreasonable that we, the Americans, recognize the Turkish flag in America. Hail. And we celebrate Armenian genocide, Mr. Kruk Krikorian. Hail. So keep in mind, ADA, American Access to Life, I represent you all. Bye. Calvin, Berman, Harrison. Followed by John Walsh. Good morning, gentlemen. My name is Sifu Kelvin Berman Harrison. Sifu is my Chinese professional title of being a retired fighter. I'm addressing um, Mayor Garcetti and Reverend Jesse Jackson, Jr. I mean Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr., Honorable One. Reverend Jesse Jackson, what is going on that you're letting individuals continue to come inside my apartment, steal from me, individuals going inside my bank account, um, being harassed in Chinatown for no apparent reason? All the times that I've spent in Chinatown over the years and spent money and my Kung Fu teachers, a lot of them from Chinatown, I was told yesterday I cannot ride my bike uh, with my shirt off and I was sitting down on a bench and I was told to leave Chinatown that I could not have my shirt on. I don't understand is when so many different nationalities walk through Chinatown and sit down in areas of public areas with their shirt off. I don't understand it. And Mayor Garcetti, I would like to know, sir, did you receive my information concerning to make America and the world better through some of my innovations that was God given to me? And Mr. Reverend Jackson, I'm tired of being played like a fool. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, John, followed by Ant Antoine Antoinette uh, Vilma. John Walsh, blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org. You can't see my face, but it's a smirk on that face because we successfully took down the Millennium $1 billion project Judge Chalfant found in our favor and shit-canned the EIR. But that's not all. They also, before they can even do another EIR, and they have to, uh, another judge shit-canned the Hollywood plan. We have had victory 
after victory after victory against turning Hollywood into a skyscraper village in the courts. And just, I, I want you to keep Mike Feuer in there. He's a joke. Take a look at Mike Feuer today. He's walking funny because he's bleeding from the anus from what we did to him in court. HollywoodHighlands.org. Mark Littman. Oh, yeah, go ahead, ma'am. And then followed by Mark Littman. I witness the best workers of my generation lose their jobs and homes and dreams to a predatory system of greedy banks. I witness the oppression of the arms and legs of this country, the workforce, the marrow of this country, the workers. We need to raise the living wage to $15 an hour. I am the worker in this country for your dream and my dream. Raise the wage, raise the wage to a living just wage. A living just wage. A living just wage for 15. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, followed by uh, Eric Previn. Good morning. My name is Mark Lippman. I'm speaking today with the tens of thousands of Angelinos who will be marching today in the streets and speaking just outside these doors at City Hall. On this May 1st, the day representing the voice of labor, and specifically here in Los Angeles, the voice of the multitude of immigrants, regardless of how any of us arrived in this country. We are all immigrants. And with that union of labor and immigration, we come to you today to make demands. It is time for a fair living wage for all employees in Los Angeles to receive a minimum of $15 an hour and the right to collective organizing. Additionally, we demand real government accountability and systemic change on the police violence that is killing our citizens here in our streets, happening in this city and around the country, from San Francisco to New York, from Ferguson to Albuquerque, from Los Angeles to Baltimore. We are all united in this. We stand together to demand justice for our dead. And Thank you very much. Followed by, thank you, sir. Henry, last speaker. Oh, Eric, I did call your name as well. Yes, I want to thank the members of the assembly and uh, especially the colleagues and successors of uh, Ozzy Gonzag and Nate Holden for agreeing not to count for them time of employees and just keep holding their money longer than the law allows. Thereby, California Government Code 20283 applies and y'all gonna make back payments for everybody who was held in temporary positions, pay us 90 days after they earned $1,000 they became eligible for pensions. And Mr. Parks is aware of that like benefit as, it, as restated in uh, August 4, 2009. He was made fully aware uh, of all your inability to account for things, suffering from craft disease, can't remember to account for things like CRA funds, FEMA funds, and all them other federal funds, we get construction work done with the GSD. Did you, did you still wish to speak? No. Did Previn, did you still wish to speak? Yes, it's... It's Eric Previn, uh, uh, city resident from District 2, and uh, Council President uh, Englander. Uh, when I arrived at the meeting this morning, I was told by law enforcement that I was not able to address the city council in public comment. Uh, I tried to stand with the group who had 600 or 100,000 signatures. I was told you can't come up to the front with that group. 
Uh, and then I just had a conversation with the city attorney briefly about the very complicated rules of the city council meeting. I want you to, I want to direct you to the Brown Act, uh, and I know you know about it. I don't want to spend my time talking about the Brown Act, but you need to provide equal um, visibility to members of the public and city staff and other people from presentations. I know there's a rule on the books that says, no, 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 we do it our own way here at city council, but that's not consistent with state law. Mr. O'Connell, uh, I have urged you, I've, I've discussed it with you in uh, various settings. Uh, you don't like to speak here at the public meeting, but we do need to remedy this, and hopefully uh, before you run for supervisor, sir, because across the street, they have a different protocol, and it's very functional. I mean, I wouldn't call it highly functional. Thank you. But it's close. Okay, so, um, Madam Clerk, what's before us now? Council has motions for posted and referral. Okay, those are posted and referred. That clears the desk. Great. Members, are there any announcements? Seeing none, uh, do we have any adjourning motions? Mr. Parks has an adjourning motion. If we can please have everybody please rise. That includes members of the public, please rise. If you're able to body, please rise for adjourning motions. And uh, if you don't wish to, that's entirely up to you. And this body uh, perhaps won't rise for you either. Okay, Mr. Parks. Thank you. I'd ask that we adjourn in memory of Policewoman Investigator 2 Franchon Blake, who was born May 1921 and passed away April 2015 at the age of 93. She was appointed to the department in May 1948 and retired in December 1973 uh, from Bunko Forgery Division. After 20 years with LAPD, she was a detective sergeant who had been pushed too far or not promoted far enough. She was forbidden from taking the lieutenant's exam. Sergeant was the highest rank open to female officers at the time, but Blake wanted to move up and be a lieutenant. After four years of taking her complaints before the city council and the police commission with little result, results, Blake took it to court. In 1973, she filed a sexual discrimination lawsuit against LAPD, and after seven years in court, was finally resolved in 1980. Franchon Blake, whose 1973 lawsuit opened the department to equal status for women, is the reason why there are now female lieutenants, captains, uh, deputy chiefs, and assistant chiefs. Blake is similarly, similarly the reason for females in Los Angeles no longer have to be at least five foot six to qualify for the job. And though Blake is Caucasian, she is also the reason why there are so many more Latino, African American, Asian officers on LAPD today. She's survived by her son Kelly, granddaughter Serena, and sister Jean, and a host of family members. The funeral service will be private. Thank you. Mr. LaBange. Yeah, yeah. I, ask, I ask that we adjourn in memory of William Bill Papalakis, who was a great, much loved man. Well into his 80s, he passed. He had the Beachwood Market. And uh, now that his son operates right there in the Beechwood Canyon in Hollywood. Uh, and there's, as we all know in our districts, when some people have local markets, they really are the mayors of the neighborhoods. And uh, we remember Bill and his family. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, no other adjourning motions? This council is adjourned. Thank you. Be safe.